Geeks, it's time to get back to the Geek Speak Radio Show on TalkZone.com with your hosts, Henry and Romo. We're back on the Geek Speak Radio Show. I'm Henry, talking to Ryan Van Cleve, who wrote the book Unplugged, My Journey into the Dark World of Video Game Addiction. Ryan, welcome back. Thanks. Okay, so let's get... Actually, before we do that, you guys want to take a call, 888-GO-FOR-IT, 888-463-6748. Uh, do you mind if we take a call real quick? Let's do it. Okay, let's go to Raul. He says he's addicted to World of Warcraft. Raul, you there? Yes, how are you guys doing? Good. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, my question was, um, do you think that uh, games like World of Warcraft are actually designed to be addictive? Like, maybe that was... They do it on purpose. Well, I... I actually have the the right answer for that. I mean, I, I have worked as a freelance writer for more than 12 years. I've also been a university professor. Um, I know a lot of game makers. I've actually worked and helped develop some games years ago. I, I know these guys. I know the terminology. The answer, very simply, is of course. Of course. It's a bottom-line dollar industry. We're talking $22 billion a year. It's, it's going to double. It's just skyrocketing the level of interest and the number of gamers and the dollars out there. If you're not buying their game, they're not getting your money. So, yeah, they want you to keep playing. They actually have a term for what you're talking about. It's called stickiness. And by stickiness, what we mean is that when you're out mowing the lawn, how much are you still thinking about questing or playing that game or throwing that touchdown pass? And the more sticky the game is, the more addictive it is. So, yeah, they absolutely understand the principles of addiction, the psychology of it, and they know what makes people play, and they incorporate it into the game design. Okay, and, and Ryan, um, let me ask, what are, for you, when you actually sat down and said, okay, I'm going to write this book, how hard was it for you to go back and revisit that dark period in your life? Well, you know, it seemed like it was something I was sure I could do because, you know, I, I thought I was kind of past it. I thought I had some good perspective. I ended up writing the wrong book twice before I wrote the book that I was trying to write, which was an honest account of how a regular person, you know, the non-stereotype gamer, can let it become, you know, the number one thing in his life. And it was it has to do with levels of denial and just avoidance. And, you know, I kept showing the drafts of the book to my friends or my agents or people, and they kept saying, hey, it's really well written, but this isn't about video games. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's all over the place. And I look at it again, I'm like, you know, I completely avoided the topic. So, I mean, even months and even years after I had gone through this and kind of got away from that, I still had a hard time kind of seeing it for what it was. I mean, now it's a little bit different. I was able to write the book. I talk to groups and people and families regularly, so I have the perspective now, but it was an awfully difficult thing to, to do. And, and one of the reasons, too, that you know, it's implicit in what you're asking here is, is why did I publish this book versus just write it? I mean, I wrote it. This kind of has to do with the way I think. I write to understand. You know, I'm a writer. This is my 16th book. I figure things out as I write them, and it took me a while to figure this one out. But um, the reason that I actually published it, because I've certainly written novels and things before that I've never published, the reason I published this one was because I realized that there was no other book like this out there. There are some books out there about video game addiction or trying to understand, you know, the, the game studies or the world design or, you know, race relations and things like this, really academic kind of stuff. But they're written mostly by and for academics. You know, regular people really don't have any access to that or any interest in some of those ideas. And I just knew that the numbers of people out there who needed to hear the story, needed to understand and have some raised awareness about what's at stake here, about how regular people could really run into problems here, there needed to be a book like that. And I realized that no one else had published one, and I don't think anyone else has any plans to anytime soon. And I realized that maybe my book was the one that had to do that. So that's really one of the big missions of my book and what I do today in talking to people is to help raise public awareness saying that, you know, there is a, an inherent, you know, danger or risk with some of these games, and we just need to be better aware and vigilant of that. And also when people have problems is understand better what to do and not just kind of laugh it off as, oh, that's not a real addiction. Do you play video games now? Uh, almost never, you know, uh, and when I do, it's certainly not the same type of games. I, I really stay away from all the role-playing, massively multiplayer online games. Those are the ones that really, um, you know, I had the biggest problems with, so I avoid those. If you ask me, could I grab a copy of Madden 2011 and, you know, give it a whirl, I could probably, you know, play a couple, you know, games with my friends or something. But, again, I won't play alone. I don't play in my room. I don't have a computer set. I don't even have a computer in my office here at work. I'm sitting here in an empty room with a phone. You know, I don't even have one here. I don't need one here. It's, it's too much of a temptation to, you know, pretend to have office hours and play for five hours. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I might play a couple hours a week or something, but I really avoid it. And I don't really have the same interest, to for most things anymore, largely because of that perspective that I understand what they are, what they're designed to do, and, 
you know, it's, it's kind of sort of the illusion about, I think, people going to like strip clubs, you know, if you go there, you have a great time. But the second you realize that they're there and they don't really like you and they just want your money, it sort of takes some of the luster off it that you had the first couple of times you might have gone. It's sort of the same with video games for me. I've kind of seen behind the curtain too much and I just sort of understand it's not just all fun and games and it's certainly not that for me. And so, no, I really I just avoid them as much as I can. And it's really not too hard to because I'm awfully busy. I have lots of other commitments and things in life. So it's it's not that difficult. If you're a gamer yourself or even a family member or a loved one, what, what are the signs to look for that um, you are a video game addict? Well, you can't really look for the physical signs too much because they too closely mirror, um, you know, office stuff like, uh, you know, you, you can get carpal tunnel syndrome or hand cramps, eye strain, headaches, looking at screens, all that kind of stuff. It's too similar to just sitting in an office. So that really won't do it. It has to do more with behavior, I think. Uh, one of the things I'd be looking for would be when people, how they act when they're unable to play. Like, let's say that you, you wanted to play Madden with your friends uh, later tonight. You made an appointment at 7 o'clock, and all of a sudden your wife or your girlfriend says, no, I got these tickets to the theater. I've been telling you for two weeks. Why don't you listen to me? We have to go. So you got to go. How you react in those situations. If you blow up and you start yelling and screaming, you know, acting inappropriately, um, you know, more than just being you know, irate or upset, that's a pretty good sign that it has an undue importance in your life, that you can't just say, you know what, you know, work around it. Another thing would be the reverse, like when you actually are playing. Uh, we've probably all heard about the, you know, the little old ladies who get behind the wheel of a car and, you know, they drive like crazy. They go into road rage. They scream or shout or, you know, act really differently than they would just in their regular behavior. I see that with video game people all the time who are really intense. They break keyboards. They throw joysticks. You know, they scream. They shout. I know people who broke TVs. You know, they just act wildly different while they're playing than when they're not. Uh, and then the other thing I'd probably watch for, too, and this one's trickier, but it's a huge warning sign if you can ever catch it, is when people lie about how much they play. If you have a roommate or, you know, a brother or sister, and they're gaming, and you go out of the house for a couple hours, you come back, and they're still gaming, you say, have you been gaming the whole time? And they're like, oh, no, no, I went down, had lunch, and I went and played, uh, you know, next door with some friends for all that came back. But really, they were playing the entire time. There is such a high level of self-denial and deception going on when they're lying to, to you and everybody else about how much they're gaming. That's a huge sign that there's something either already in place that's bad or it's well on its, its way towards a video game addiction. And how would you suggest they get help with the addiction? Well, that's a little bit trickier, you know, with, uh, with a lot of the other sort of, you know, more well-publicized addictions in this country, you know, you know what to do. As a matter of fact, they even publicize it on the advertisements, like, uh, you know, with the gambling, if you see a commercial for Harris Casino or something, they usually got the hotline number for Gamblers Anonymous at the end of the commercial. You know, we all know about Al-Anon, right, for alcoholics. Uh, we, we really don't know quite so much what to do with video game addiction. So it's, it's kind of an issue. And here's the thing, too. Uh, a lot of people who, um, who might be able to help you with a lot of those other issues, behavioral therapists, marriage and family counselors, people like this, a lot of them don't quite know what to do with video game addiction because it's such a new kind of phenomenon, at least in their experience, that they don't know why the strategies they have on helping you for your cocaine addiction or for your sex addiction or things like this, why those same strategies don't work so well for video game addiction. So if you ever do have to go to professional, you want to make sure you get somebody who has experience with digital addiction or video game addiction directly, because otherwise you're going to have a frustrating experience and so are they. And that's part, again, of what my book is about, is to let people know how serious it is. And I have a resource section in the back for a lot of groups and organizations. And I also, too, have a website that I, uh, you know, have a contact information uh, form on so people can zip me notes. And I try to hook them up with people in their area. It's just the name of the book, unpluggedthebook.com. And that's a great place to kind of go where people can find out the latest breaking news on this kind of thing, as well as where maybe they can get help and what they can do on their own if maybe they're not at the point where they need professional help yet. They just want more information for themselves or about the person in their lives they're concerned about. And we do have a link to that, by the way, on geekspeakradioshow.com if you guys want to go take a look at that. And um, if this is sounding familiar to someone out there or a loved one, a family member, you're saying, hey, you're talking about my son, my cousin, whoever, would you suggest that they intervene kind of like uh, you would with a, an alcoholic or, or no? What, what would you say to them? It depends on the level of situation and, I guess, the relationship you've got with them. I'm actually writing a second book right now that's really a nuts and bolts on the things you're talking about here. I mean, Unplugged, to me, is really shows people what's at stake. It helps people understand what's going on. It helps people understand that, you know, my spouse or my kid, they're not just choosing the game over me. They're really hooked, and they just can't even quite fathom what they're doing. and They're, they're out of control, literally. It helps people understand that. You know, it's also, too, beyond just the video game stuff. It's a book about, you know, self-empowerment. It's about 
making better choices in your life, about taking responsibility for your actions and finding your true purpose. It's about all those things. But I wanted a book, too, that really answers the questions you're talking about, that really tries to empower people on what they can do. And intervention is sort of a last stage effort where all else has failed. So, yeah, there are some people who need an intervention. If people are locked up in their rooms and they're not coming out for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours at a time, they're not going to work anymore, um, you know, things like this, or their health at stake, it's a real issue. And then maybe at that stage you probably need the intervention. And if that happens, I would probably try to get the help of an intervention specialist. You know, you probably see it on TV. They've got intervention or things like that. Those can get pretty scary and pretty, you know, violent. Maybe not physically violent, but, I mean, there's a lot of energy and, you know, sometimes nastiness going on in the air because a lot of dirty laundry comes out. And a lot of times people aren't ready for it. So I would try to have a professional there if you can do that. But, yes, I think there are some people who absolutely need that sort of external help. And also, too, one of the things that my book has at the end in the resource section is some uh, programs that people can go to to sort of, you know, get detoxed, which is like oftentimes wilderness programs are where you go. And this is true if you have a, you know, Facebook addiction or Internet addiction, video game addiction, anything with technology, you know, BlackBerry addiction. You just you want to get away for two weeks or six weeks. These wilderness programs get you out there. They teach you teamwork. They teach you about health. They get you away from the technological world. You don't watch TV. You don't listen to the radio. You kind of just cut the cord. And you've got that support system in place so that you build up a lot of the skills and values and interests, again, that you maybe used to have. So when you come back to this world that has this technology everywhere, it's hard to get away from you have a better relationship and perspective so you can better handle it. So that's that's a real value, too, related to the intervention idea. Is the medical community recognizing this or at least starting to? Because it is pretty much all, all around. It's on our cell phones. It's, you know, it's pretty much everywhere. So are they starting to recognize it as a real problem? Well, we're a little slow in this country. I mean, China and South Korea call video game addiction their number one public health issue. Uh, a study a year ago Talking to Chinese youth under 18, 48% of them thought that they had a problem with video games. 48%. It's not a surprise that you've got the Chinese government putting up counseling centers around the country for which people can go for free to get information and get the help that we're talking about here when people are on the path of video game addiction if they're already there. South Korea is already banning games. They're saying we don't want that game in our country. They're, they're modifying certain games so that you know, if you get a certain amount of points for doing activities in the game, after a set amount of hours, you start getting less and less points until you get zero points for doing the same things. as a disincentive to play for 10 or 20 or 30 hours in a row, which some people have done. They're also talking about blackout periods where you can't do certain games during, um, you know, overnight periods. There's a six or eight hour window where you can't game anymore. They'll turn off the Internet or they'll turn off the games so you can't play it because they have too many of these kids sitting in these 24 hour cafes. Internet cafes playing World of Warcraft or StarCraft or EverQuest or whatever, 30 and 40 hours. I mean, it was only a couple of years ago a guy died from, you know, 50 hours straight of StarCraft. You know, he had a heart attack. Uh, these things can happen when you don't care for yourself. So uh, we're a little slow in this country. I mean, we know about it. The American Medical Association in 2007 did a study where they said that over 5 million kids age 8 to 18 here in the United States alone, would meet a clinical definition for video game addiction. But to answer your question, we don't have a clinical definition yet. I mean, we can figure out what it would be, but the American Psychological Association, they're the ones who actually say this is an addiction, this isn't. They have that, you know, diagnostic statistical manual, the DSM-4, and they have they haven't put it in. They're, they're going to do a revision of it in the next year or so, so it might make it, but uh, whether it does or doesn't, it doesn't, you know, lessen the effect or the impact that the games have on a lot of people's lives today. Okay, so we're talking to Ryan Van Cleve. He wrote the book Unplugged, My Journey into the Dark World of Video Game Addiction. There's a link on GeekSpeakBetaShow.com for his website, for the Amazon if you want to get the book. 888-GO-FORWARD is a phone number if you have any questions. 888-463-6748. 888-463-6748. Comments at GeekSpeakBetaShow.com if you want to just email us. GeekSpeak Radio Show will be right back. 